And thank you for stepping inside the principal's office this morning. I'm so excited to be here with you all today. My name is Michael McWilliams. Everyone calls me Mac. All of my friends call me Mac. I am one half of the team that brings you inside the principal's office twice a month. Uh, I uh, was a career principal, uh, spending 20 years in the elementary principal seat. Now I have the distinct pleasure to be a consultant and I travel the country coaching principals and coaching uh, staffs. Uh, and I'm just excited. This is one of my favorite spaces to be in inside the principal's office. We are building a community of leaders that can learn and lead together. I am so excited for this guy, Charles, uh, my co-host. Uh, how's it going, man? Hey, it is going well, and um, I know that things look a little bit different. I don't have my usual background set up here, but I am in New York. I am at the CSA conference, the Council for School Administrators. Uh, so excited to be out here. And of course, since I am in New York, as you already pointed out, I'm going to spend some time with my baby, who is off in her freshman year out this way, but I'm very excited. Be Exactly, right? Like, <laughs> uh, but excited to be here in this space with you all as we come together. As you mentioned, is that we're growing and building and connecting leaders from all over and just really excited to have this conversation. Uh, as Max and my name is Charles Williams. I am one half of this duo that makes up inside the principal's office. I am an assistant principal in Chicago, the host of the Counter Narrative podcast and the founder of CW Consulting. So you guys know who we are. You come here every week or every other week, I should say, you get to spend some time with us, but we have some guests with us. One, we have a returning guest, co-author of our book that we'll talk about a little bit later, but we have a new face in the space. So we're going to turn it over to Saba to kick things off. Tell us who you are. Well, thank you for having me. I am a, um, I'm an educator. I started, you know, teaching high school social science and kind of evolved into different areas of education. Uh, but most recently, I um, launched my own company called Designing Schools and really excited to bring the power of design thinking to education. Well, thank you for being here. We are so excited that you're joining us and being able to help us as we dive into this conversation. And Rob, you are a returning face, someone we know very well. How are you today, sir? Sorry about that. It's raining and cool in Texas, which is nice uh, for once, but I'm excited to get on here and talk a little bit about designing schools and learn a little bit from all of you guys. Well, thank you, Rob. And as we, we say every single time that we are in this space, it is the four of us here having this conversation, but it does not need to be maintained right in that space. So if you are here joining us, first of all, let us know that you're here. Say, drop by, say good morning. But throughout the conversation, make sure that you are dropping your own questions or sharing your thoughts as we move forward through the dialogue. Very good. Well, let's get started. One of the things that I like about this environment is it is a place for leaders to learn. Uh, and every day of our career, we are leading and learning simultaneously. We are leading, uh, but we also are learning. And I'm excited because I'm gonna just be vulnerable. I'm gonna be vulnerable. Today is gonna really be a learning day for me because uh, when the topic came up, we tried to explore many things that are uh, trends in education, many conversations, and I just wanna be vulnerable. You will never be an expert in everything. 
So today I will say that when we begin this conversation about integrating design thinking in our schools, I'm gonna be more of a learner today than a leader. So I am so excited to hear from you. I've done some research to prepare for today, so I have prepped for today. Uh, but I just want to be honest and saying I am interested in hearing what this group has uh, to say about design thinking and how this can help us reach our goal the fund of the fundamental purpose of education, which is to ensure that all kids learn at high level. So let's jump right hey, in. Wait, Matt, aren't you the learning leader? I am the learning leader. I'm the lead learner. Yes. I'm on a model today that is okay as a leader not to know everything. Just put it out there. And I put it out there with my colleagues today that I am going to learn from you today. And I may have more questions than uh, expert advice today. So let's jump right into our question number numero uno. Inside the principal's office discussion question one. Design thinking is a methodology for creative problem solving. What are some examples and how can we use design thinking in core subjects and across the curriculum in our schools? And we're going to uh, go to the lady on the panel first, ladies first. So ask Miss Q. I'm interested to pick your brain and hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm first of all so excited to dive into this question. I think there are so many opportunities for us to integrate it, both from a curricular standpoint, but also from a like self-reflection and self-awareness standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I always one of my favorite, favorite ways to start ever introducing anyone, adult, child, to design thinking, <laughs> is using a game called the Extraordinaires. And it's these fantasy characters. And um, you each kind of get a card. And on the front side of the card is this fictional character, like a mermaid or a ninja or like a robot or something just completely like wild. And on the back of the card, challenge at this series of images that challenge your assumption about what those things are. So when I say robot, ninja, mermaid, any of these things, there's, there's a certain thing that just comes to our mind. So the back of the card really challenges those assumptions and the students kind of do like a little bit of empathy digging, like, huh, what's going on here? Or what's going on there? And then they design something like an object or a household item or a vehicle for the character. But one of the things that that type of experience allows for people to do is not have that kind of curricular pressure for, you know, this is wait, this is how I'm supposed to do something. A lot of those preconceived ways. So first and foremost, the extraordinaires is like my number one go to recommendation for anyone looking to just dive in and experience design thinking, because I don't believe it's something that you can really lecture on in 45 minutes. And great. Now we all know design thinking. Um, but the other thing I will say, because you kind of raised that just a little bit earlier around, you know, how do we do things for all learners? One of the, I used to teach social science. And so, and I know very aware that this is not the case in every single state, but in California, for example, our history social science frameworks integrate a lot of essential questions. And I think a lot of times in our curriculums and in our classes, we're using these guiding questions, but a lot of times we're answering it for the kids. Right. Yes, this is our essential question, but now we're going to do this activity and this activity and this activity. And, you know, I recently have been diving into the ethnic studies curriculum. It's a new requirement here in California. And one of the essential questions in that curriculum is how were race and ethnicity used to shape the United States and how are they continuing to shape contemporary issues like that's actually in our standards and our framework for social science. Mm -hmm. And that right there to me is like this beautiful exploratory question that sure you could go about doing a series of activities and lectures on it, or you can let it be open to the kids and use the design thinking process to be like, okay, like how do race and ethnicity continue to shape the culture of the United States and our contemporary issues? Um, we're gonna talk to these people and these people and hear from their experiences, actually narrow down on a challenge they face and create a solution for what's going on. Um, I'll give you one more example and just a really like personal level for kids is career, college and career readiness. What do we wanna do with our lives? What are our strengths? Like not just always empathy for other people, but sometimes empathy for ourselves. So sort of like three totally different examples, but again, just many different facets and ways in which it can be integrated. Okay, well, I'm gonna jump in and 
instead of having a comment, I'm gonna I'm gonna probe I'm gonna probe you if that if that's possible. <laughs> For those of uh, our viewers that may be like Matt, that you know is you know we'll talk about a cognitive ladder of design thinking on the first rung. Could you please just give us a a definition when we start talking about design thinking? Could you just kind of what is what is design thinking? How would you define Absolutely. It for those that may not yeah. be familiar with the term? I would say let's put it into two buckets. It's a method and a mindset. Okay? okay, It's a method because it's giving you kind of the step by step by step way of not just solving a problem, but actually finding out what the root cause of something might be that needs to be addressed mm -hmm. so we can open the door to an opportunity that we want to see take place. Like what, what is the barrier that's in our way mm -hmm. to preventing us from getting to where we want to go? So that's the first thing I would say. It's a method very strategic, very, very, very step-by-step, -step, a framework that you can lean on mm -hmm. to have conversations and discoveries to which you don't know the answer. That's, that's the main thing. The second part of it, that's the most exciting part to me, is it's mindset. And so a lot of times we're unlearning habits so that mm -hmm. we can learn new ones, just simple things like creative confidence, right? Like you go into a room and you ask people like how many of you think you're great at problem solving or how many of you think you're great at creativity and pe people are hesitant to like you know put their hands up um things like um learning from failure a lot of these like very like generic buzzwordy terms that we hear all the time but you've got to put strategy in place for people to actually be able to adopt these mindsets because that's not how we grew up and it's not how we've done things and so to expect us to then Teach that and do that model for somebody else is challenging. It's hard. So things like learning from failure, things, at the biggest one, knowing that your first try isn't your last try. Mm. Uh, but to me, sort of like why I really gravitate to this method over others is the empathy mindset, right? I'll always approaching things from curiosity um, versus judgment. And I would say like that's, that's to me is the biggest, biggest asset that we get, especially like given the type of world that we live in today that is so global, that is so diverse. Um, are becoming closer and closer and barriers are you know breaking down more and more by the day that empathy mindset and how you approach any situation personal professional academic um it is really 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 a powerful thing to be able to have the quality awesome awesome rob what are your thoughts on this question number one how my can thoughts, you go ahead my thoughts are i gotta follow that um <laughs> No, you know, I, one of the things I think that uh, that I heard and I really is like is this, this idea of mindset. And and I think from a school leader perspective, when I think of that, I'm like, I, I want to think about the culture of inquiry. And do we have that? Do we have this idea that we're going to go about and ask questions and be curious? Um, and and t teachers need to do that and they need to develop that culture in their room. So I think that's a big piece there. I think the, the other thing that I, I would ask is, you know, who's doing the thinking? when all that's going on in the classroom, is it the teacher or is it the kids? And so I think, we, I think that that's an important, uh, you know, reflective question to ask. And, you know, uh, she talked about, you guys talked about uh, these essential questions and how a lot of times they're provided for teachers in the, in the curriculum and things like that. And I think we, uh, we've got to be bold enough to go away from those essential questions sometimes. And the curriculum directors out there may be yelling at me right now, but, uh, but teachers need to frame it as a provocative question a question that goes across the curriculum and we're trying to authentically solve a problem or, or something that matters. Uh, and you can do that cross curricularly where you might not be able to, if you just have an essential questions about math or just essential question about ELA. And so I think a lot of it comes down to that is do we have a culture that allows that in our building? Um, you know, that, that idea of, uh, I didn't fail the first. Would you say the first time versus the last time? I didn't yeah, try something. Yeah, like your first try isn't your last try. Yes, I love that. Like I love life, that. I'm, right? I'm writing. I'm writing it down right now. But I think that uh, you know, to to truly embrace this design thinking, this 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 uh, method and mindset. I mean, a leader's going to have to let go a little bit. A teacher's going to have to let go a little bit, and be intentional about what it is they're trying to uh, allow their kids to do. Awesome. Yeah, like awesome. I was going to ask Mac and Charles, like, what what is it like from a leadership perspective to say, like, you hear a concept like design thinking, you want to bring it to your schools, like, like what is you, the barrier you see that you would design think around in integrating an approach like that? So, I, I, so what I, I was going to say? Go no, go ahead, Rob. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say sometimes uh, we do that to ourselves because. Uh, 
we become afraid that we don't we won't get the right test scores. Mm -hmm. uh, that becomes a barrier and an unfortunate barrier. But sometimes I think, I guess if we if we spend all this time doing this other stuff, we won't cover what we have to cover for a test, whether it's a, a unit test or a state test. So, and that's unfortunate. I, again, that goes back to a little bit of your culture. But go ahead, Charles. I'm sorry. No, no, you're you're fine. So you know, I it was interesting because you know Saba you mentioned it and then rob you kind of backed it up and i i wanted to initially touch on this is this idea of this you know essential or guiding question right um and i think the same thing goes for us as leaders is that we kind of know where we want to be and we we give the image right the facade that like oh there's autonomy oh there's space to be creative but in reality we're putting in these very very narrow parameters to say okay i'm going to make sure that you get to where i want you to be Right, because we're so afraid, as I think Rob was just saying, is what happens if we don't get there? Is it okay? Like I, I've defined mastering a standard as X, Y, Z, but if you figure it out, if you go down this learning pathway, this idea of creation, and, and you end up somewhere else, but maybe you, you've learned a new way to master it, like I don't know if I know how to capture that. And if I don't know if I know how to capture it, then how do I prove it to, you know, whomever I am held accountable to? And so I think, you know, when we're looking at these things, one, we do, we have to kind of give that up and understand that the systems in which we're operating have to be maybe reimagined a little bit um, because we are, you know, as we know, our educational system was built for efficiency, right? Effectiveness and efficiency, not to get creative. Um, and yet we're moving into this area of instead of becoming consumers, that we want our students to be creators. And yet we put these narrow for, uh, parameters. Um, and so I, I just, I'm, I know for me, right, it's, it is a scary thing. You, you tell our, you know, we tell our teachers, hey, you have this autonomy, get creative. How are we gonna solve this problem, right? But at the end, I have somebody to answer to. And so I don't think it just happens in our classroom. I think it has to be mirrored within in our administration not just even at our administration, but at our district and even higher to say, are we going to have some freedom, some spaces where we can truly implement these things? So that way that our first try is not our final try. It doesn't become a failure that impacts grades and accountability and everything else. And then we're done trying. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's such a valid point because I remember just even when I, so when I was a first year teacher, like I got a layoff notice. Like I graduated during the recession. It was like a disaster for the first five years. But I think one of the greatest epiphanies I had through that process was just how every single person has a layer above them. But we, we're all, not always cognizant of that layer that exists like above. So it's like, again, breaking those barriers in conversations and those silos to get people around really like this shared vision for what we're trying to do. So that, that was a great point you brought up. Charles is uh, the, the brains of the duo. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> I think uh, one of the barriers for leadership is I, I say, uh, one of the things that I say all the time is a leader cannot lead beyond their current exposure. So it is scary to lead people um, into a direction that you don't have a lot of uh, experience in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, it's, it's difficult to be um, vulnerable to a staff to say, I, I, you know, or to, I think as a leader, that would be the biggest barrier for me is, um, do I have enough research? Do I have enough knowledge to truly be a learning leader? You know what I'm saying? Am I far enough with my learning that I can take a team and expose them to a concept and lead them into it. I think that is the biggest barrier is just, of course, there's when I Googled and did some research to prepare today, there's tons of things out there, uh, but it's taking the time to read. And a most important part of our, our, our learning is asking questions and surrounding yourself with experts in the field that you can talk. I've read an article, I've read research, but now even finding a, a community of learners that you can learn along with. So, you know, I, I was going to say, and, and I know this kind of touches, I, I think, on the next question a little bit is this bridging. Um, but this idea of just using design thinking across curriculums and subjects, I think, as Rob pointed out, instead of maybe calling them guiding questions, I like that idea of provocative questions, right? Like I, I was just doing an evaluation in a classroom the other day and the guiding question that is presented to us by the curriculum, right? This says, why did Tom get melanoma? 
well, I think it's like as students learn concepts of like like cancer and cell mitosis and all of those things, it's like, oh, it's very easy. This is a very definitive. But maybe, right, as we're talking about design thinking, it's like, how could Tom have not and got it, right? And so now we start to think of like, well, what could we have done differently? How could we have approached it? Mm -hmm. I'm still learning the concepts of the why, but right. coming up with how could we have done something differently? How can we approach this? Mm -hmm. There could be a number of answers, right? Answers that we as a society are still trying to figure out. So to be able to present that to students really creates this openness. But I think that just, again, goes back to the idea of saying, we are all going to step into the unknown. We're all going to step into our uncomfortness, right? Mm -hmm. and, and say, let's see where this goes. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. Um, but I know that, as I mentioned, that's this idea for our next question. But before, before we get into our next question, of course, we always do a little pause in between, right? We talk about our book inside the principal's Ooh. office, which I mentioned, you have three of the authors right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, and I think the one thing I want to touch on is this idea in there. It talks about making sure that we are the lead learners in our building, that we must make sure that we dive into those spaces and say, how do I lead the learning in my space? And so I definitely want to uh, highlight that. But we always talk about our book, but school rubric, the mastermind behind this book and this show, Wallace, who is always behind the scenes, there is another book that just came out, 50 Tips for New Teachers. And so I would definitely want you guys to check this out. Uh, Casey Jakubowski, uh, a, a gentleman who joined me on my podcast up in rural New York. Uh, Sam, uh, Dr. Sam from EduMagic is in this book, along with a few other authors. And so definitely, uh, if you are a new educator, check this out. And I would definitely say this, that even if you're not a new educator, this might be something we come back to because we might say, oh, yeah, right, or learn something new. Because as we're talking about in this space, it's never too late to learn something new. So definitely go make sure that you check out 50 tips for new teachers. Um, let's. With that being said, let's jump into question number two because we're about halfway through the show. So let's see what that one is. Inside the principal's office discussion question two. The concept of design thinking can sometimes be challenging and a learning curve itself to master. What are some strategies that we can use with teachers to introduce them to the concept and help them improve their competency in this area? And this is a great question, right? We were talking a little bit about like, what is design thinking? How can it look? But now what do we do? with it right we, we want to make sure that we're bridging that over and so you know Saba, i don't want to keep putting you on the spot but you are the expert so i'm going to come to you first and then i'm sure that will spark some thinking in the rest of us all right well i won't say i'm the expert but i will say i went and learned from the experts right that, that's again i think that's such a big part of i think it's such a, a theme of this what our conversation is this willingness to be vulnerable enough to say i don't know and i want to learn more like right. that that in and of itself is 80 percent of your journey towards any new practice or any new competency so i um first learned about design thinking from two first grade teachers while I was teaching at a university, okay? So we don't even always have to be learning on like the same level, um, but there were two teachers at a school called Design 39 in San Diego. It was in 2000 and about 14. And I, I was just, I was in awe. Like I, I was so mesmerized by not only their culture of collaboration, so the teachers did not work in silos like my classroom, math, English, science, history. Um, but the other thing I was really, that really resonated with me was they, had taken the concept of just reading a book, like reading a children's book, like something as simple as that. But instead of like trying to upend and like, you know, disrupt the entire curriculum and way of doing things, they just reframed it. Instead of just simply reading the storybook to the children, yeah, they read it to them, but then they said, choose a character and we want you to solve a challenge that the character in a book has. And I was like, wow. Like it, it was the simplest, like anybody can do that. It's just a difference in how we approach what it is we're doing. So that's the first thing I would just want to let people know is that design thinking is not like, let's go disrupt and throw everything out. It's like, no, let's just like tweak the way in which we're approaching it and, and create a more open-ended um, scenario. So that was just an experience that one took me down the rabbit hole of design thinking. I started using it in the class I was teaching it and I was digging into it more and more and more. And it just never left me like, 
Like, how are they able to do this? Because they were a public school, so they're still doing the standards, they're still doing the testing, they're still doing all the things, yet I never got to teach in that way. And I was like, why not? And so when I went back to graduate school, I knew that that was the story I wanted to tell. Like I went back to get do my doctorate to tell that story, but I wanted to tell it with a layer of research just to give it that extra validity. And so I always say that like, it's like that iceberg analogy. When we see site visits and we see schools and we see practices, we're, we're seeing the top. We're seeing the creativity, the collaboration, like the outcomes of what we're seeing. The research allowed for was to go below the iceberg and see, okay, but how is that happening? And I will tell you, it came down to one, like, let's, let's say it came down to two concepts that I feel like at least as an educator growing up, like I never heard about, not in my school, not in like, even in my practice was building a culture of trust and vulnerability. These were the two single-handed things that allowed them to really sustain and go deeper into their practice. And so the one, I would say, barrier that they had removed in creating this culture of trust and vulnerability was understanding each other's strengths. So a lot of times, even when we think about design thinking or project-based learning, or you name any new initiative, we actually start with the initiative and make the assumption that everyone's ready to roll. Like, okay, we're gonna come together to talk about this and let's just collaborate and go. There's like five layers before you can even get to successful collaboration that if you don't do those layers, you're just not gonna get those outcomes. And I think it's one of the reasons we struggle. I don't think it's we struggle in schools because we don't know what to do. I think it's because we haven't created the foundational elements for people to work together successfully. And so that building that culture of trust is a huge one. Um, understanding each other's strengths. They have this one line. They said, when we come together in collaboration, um, we begin by asking what energizes you. And that's not to say that we only do the things that we like, but like, if I really like doing something and you really like doing something else, like wh why, why are we not getting together to accelerate what needs to be done, <laughs> especially leveraging the technology and resources that we have to advance in our goals? Like, why are we all trying to do everything alone? And so again, it's a mindset shift, right? Because school teaches you like, no, only one person gets BA, only one person is the valedictorian, only one person gets to come out on top. Whereas in, in today's world, collaboration means, they said, when you put an idea on the table, it's no longer our idea, it's no longer my idea, it's our idea. Again, mindset, these are huge mindset shifts, easy lines, huge mindset shifts. And so for me, I would say like that, creating that culture of trust and psychological safety is, is just the foundational component for anything it is that we want to see moving forward, design thinking, no design thinking, it doesn't matter. I'm really glad you said that. I mean, we, we just mentioned in our book, right? Collaboration, <laughs> the new book that came out, yeah. collaboration. Like, I, I don't know if that would have ever happened without, you know, Rob coming yeah. to us and saying, hey, let's let's do this thing. And so we, we just put our ideas together. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I, so I, I love the fact that you mentioned those two things, this idea of, you know, kind of starting like, reframing but as well as that system of trust and support right as we go through this journey i want to know that i have the support of my administrators and the, the the one thing that really was in my mind as i was looking at this question is that design thinking and i think a lot of times we do this as educators with any program is that is all there is like everything else goes out and that's all there is right, right? but design thinking becomes you can't kind of skip out the foundational aspect right and so it's not mm -hmm. like hey i'm starting this lesson in this design thing, like, and it just runs throughout. Like, yeah, I need to understand my core, my foundational concepts and skills, so that way I can launch into there. Just as you said, we read the book and then we started diving into it. So I think a lot of times teachers are like, how do I do this from, you know, day one of the unit to day whatever of the unit? And it's like, no, this is a tool. This is a practice that we're going to use at some point within our unit, within our lesson. It doesn't necessarily have to be all encompassing. So I think, we like to do that for some reason as educators. It's a, like either all or nothing, right? There are all, everything that we talk about, it's either here or here or here or here. There's never, we, we rarely use the word and, right? It's like, mm -hmm. there, there, we, can, we can blend things. Yeah. yeah, I really like how you brought up earlier, like we always say like, we wanna give people autonomy and we're doing this, but we put it in these like isolated areas and we've like created like really strong parameters around it. I do think that like one of the biggest benefits of design thinking is like before you even get to the students, like when leaders just bring it to the table for teachers and give them the autonomy to decide 
how it can be implemented, that's where I think you can have a lot more effective implementation for any idea, not just that one, but again, just giving, really allowing for that authentic autonomy, I think is huge. No, I was just gonna say, that's exactly what I was gonna say, was that bringing that culture of trust uh, to your teachers and giving them some autonomy to do that. But I also think it's, you know, it's important to, that teachers understand how to be intentional about design learning. And really, uh, it's not just that we're uh, getting together to do group work or we're going to do a canned PBL, but we're, you know, we're making it authentic and it's going to, it's going to have some learning, some meaningful learning for the kids. And, and that takes time. It takes time to plan. And I think one of the things you can do as a, as a strategy is from a leadership standpoint is make sure that your teachers have the time to do that. And, you know, say, Hey, we want to try this. What's it going to take? How are we going to do it? Um, and it may mean you have to be a little creative. <laughs> um, and, and I would also include in that time is teachers have to be learners too. And so build in some reflection time. What went well with this? What didn't go well? You know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna accept that mindset of, uh, you know, first try, last try, then we have to take time to, to learn from our first try. So I would say I'll wrap Absolutely. all that into one, all that into one to help build that capacity. <laughs> Most definitely. And the cultural collaboration, I think, is key when you are implementing anything, design thinking mm -hmm. or anything that you bring to a school, um, identifying those early adopters and those that are showing proficiency early and then allowing time for teachers to collaborate and to, again, ask those critical questions. And um, I think the biggest thing that we have to ask when we reflect and we collaborate is, not just how is the implementation of this going and how do we feel implementing, but we always have to drill down to student outcomes. And that is let's collaborate around what we're implementing, but also let's have a, uh, a focus on results. Are our efforts showing up in student data? Are kids with design thinking, are they learning those things that we say every kid at every level should learn? Um, so a cultural collaboration that really focuses on student outcomes that we're not just uh, implementing something because it's the, the latest mm -hmm. word, design thinking. But at the end of the day, everyone on board has to see and there has to be data to support. That we continue to uh, make our learning very robust in this area because we see that as we learn more, kids are learning more. So, uh, you know, when we implement, we still have to make sure that we're really, really focused on, is this working for our kids? Are, is the trajectory of learning increasing and is the gap closing uh, for the kids uh, and the children that we're serving? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I feel like because you guys have mentioned almost like that equity piece so much, I'll share one of the most interesting pieces of research. It was um, Paul Atwell. And he said, you know, we don't just have a digital divide. We also have, um, uh, no, he said, we don't just have like a, oh God, I'm not going to remember it right now. He said, we have a new digital divide is what he said. Mm -hmm. We have a new digital divide. And he said, so often we think it's enough to just throw technology into the hands of learners. Right. But he said, what happens in that scenario is we actually widen the equity gap because a lot of times when we look at low socioeconomic areas or you know schools that are struggling, especially urban schools, it's all drill and kill. They're using technology to kind of like, oh, no, we've got to get those standards. We've got to like, you know, just really reinforce it even more, which I think with this whole like learning loss and all this other stuff and this narrative that's out there that kids are like losing, 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 puts even more pressure on people to be like, OK, let me get even stricter with you now, where he said in more affluent areas, people are leveraging technology for problem solving, for creativity, for critical thinking. And mm -hmm. so, again, it just so much of this has to do with like the structures that we're trying to create in schools that yeah. I often even say, like, before you even think about the kids like as adults use the practices to lean on to really be able to get to those outcomes that you're hoping for. Because to your guys' point, it's not mutually exclusive, right? I think it also kind of forces us, like I know one big thing that I always think about is what do we, what do we celebrate? If we're only celebrating, you know, you got a five on your AP exam and this and this and that, like that, that sends a message to, to kids that, that that's what we value. And that's not to say that we have to throw those out but we also get to create our own measures for what we're going to celebrate within our right. communities, right? And so right. how we balance that and how we create those balance of measures, like kind of to your point, what you were saying of, you know, how are we gonna get that data? Like data, yes, is some imposed upon us by what we have to do, 
but there's also things we can create as well. And that balance, I think, teaches us that, yeah, tomorrow, if you want to go to law school, you want to go to med school, no one's throwing at the MCAT anytime soon, right? Like you are going to have to learn these different practices, but what are you going to celebrate for yourself as you navigate those steps towards things that may be challenging? Excellent conversation this morning. So we're going to move on to our favorite part of the show, and that is ideas that stick. Um, so our question today, what is the one element you can share that you have seen in schools or classrooms that have successfully implemented design thinking? And we're going to go to Charles first. You know, it's interesting. I, I feel like Saba read my response and then like used it in her. No, I'm joking. So, when, you know, when I, I think also I think it's, it's, it's the other way around, Charles. You at least listen to her. And then I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to make myself feel better here. Uh, the, the, so I think a lot of times when I thought about this idea, I think with design thinking, you know, we oftentimes think immediately like the higher grade levels, right? Older students. It's like there's no way that babies can be engaging in this sort of thing. So I love the fact that when, you know, Sabo started it, she was like these first grade teachers introduced me to it. And so in my building for the last, uh, you know, six years where I was at, um, I had babies. And so I thought, how do we make this thing happen? So one tool that we utilized was Lakeshore Learning. So big shout out to them. Um, but they have these STEM kits. And the beautiful thing with these STEM kits is it, it was exactly that. So for example, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, like the, uh, the gingerbread man, right? You read about the gingerbread man, but now they have to design like, well, the gingerbread man, he has to get across the river. How do we design a flotation device for him to get across the river? Right. Um, there was another one. It was, uh, you know, Little Red Riding Hood and she was carrying her basket full of goodies to grandma's house. How do we design a basket that can hold the most the maximum load of these items? And so, you know, and the, these are children's stories, right, that we're reading with, you know, kindergartners, first graders. And then they start going through the whole design thinking process of figuring out there's this issue. How do we approach it? How do we build prototypes and figure this thing out? Right. And so you're you're blending in, which just goes back to this idea of that none of these things should necessarily exist in these silos of, of content areas to say, well, this has to be here. This has to be here. It was a full merging and blending. So that way I could use all the skills, all the knowledge, all of those different areas to create something brand new. And it was always powerful. And the beautiful thing is during PDs, I would do it with my staff. My staff are like, these are kids fairy tales. Yeah. But let's figure out how to build systems yeah. to, to solve this and to watch them engage, right? With something so primary, I guess you could say it was phenomenal. So definitely there's a tool, an element that you could utilize. And I just wanted to highlight, it doesn't just have to be with older students. Awesome. Rob, Robert? Sure. Um, so I was I was thinking about this as you guys were sharing and talking, and one of the one of my favorite memories uh, being a middle school principal, I had a teacher that was trying to implement and do some of these things, and you know she kind of created her, her ELA class into a humanities class and was trying to solve problems, authentic problems. And anyway, we got to go to a we got to go on a field trip to a research hospital, and I remember this this gentleman. He brought us in. He was showing us what was a three million dollar microscope. And I didn't even know $3 million microscopes existed to tell you the truth. But he said, there's a, you know, and he started talking to the kids about this tool. And then he, he said, but you know what the most important thing is? And he picked up his little journal like this and just a little composition notebook. And what he said was, I need you to learn and think and reflect. The tools don't matter what I, when we're trying to solve a problem. What are we learning with these things and these tools? And so I've always tried to remember that from this idea of write and reflect. Uh, and, and I thought that was a good lesson to hear from an authentic person, a real scientist, researcher, if you will, uh, tell the students that. And, and I think that's something that I've tried to stress with, with teachers and, uh, and administrators as I've gone in is, is give kids time to write and reflect about what they're learning, because I think you have to build that into the design. And you have, and, and I think that goes cross curricular and it helps them. Uh, it, it, it just does a lot of things. Right. And I think that sometimes we don't take enough time to do those. Uh, so I would encourage uh, people to continue to do that as they're designing their learning. So that's it. Good deal. Sir Charles? Well, I already went, so I'm going <laughs> to turn it over to Sawa. Yeah. yeah, Sawa, sorry. 
No, that's great. I would say, you know, mine is really like, it's like my tagline, like everywhere, just like truly live and believe this, it's that innovation begins with empathy. You know, I, I think so many times, like I said, we put technology at the forefront instead of people. And I think, you know, even if you were listening to us in our conversation, we were like, yeah, I was kind of thinking that too. Or like, yeah, you said this, and it made me think this. And I think so often, like, there was a, there's a really great um, research piece by uh, Robert Rueda, he's a professor at USC. And he says, so often when we come to the table to learn new things, we think it's all about knowledge. I need to give you knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Mm-hmm. And what we neglect to think about is motivation. Nine out of mm-hmm. 10 times people have the knowledge, they don't have the motivation and there's organizational barriers that are in our way. And so I think, again, if we just open the door to you know really think about beginning with people and investing in people, like one of my favorite lines from the research was, educators are inherent design thinkers. We already do a lot of these things. And they were like, oh, it was just alignment of vocabulary and words and just a different way of like thinking about it. But I would just want everyone to know, like, we have so much of this already. It's just a matter of giving people the time and space to remember that about themselves. So innovation begins with empathy and just people, people, people. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a great lead in to what I have to say, Saba. Uh, people, people, people. I believe in education. We see, we view a lot of uh, what we need to do for kids through the lens of programs. What program, what program, design thinking. Tell me about that program. But I believe that it's not programs that make things happen for kids. It's people, people, people. So I would say that the thing that we need uh, to, to, to consider uh, is collaboration and tre- creating a true culture of collaboration in our schools, a true culture of collaboration in our schools. So that again, you find those people like, I mean, I think today is a great example of collaborating. There are four people here at various levels of understanding of the concept. And for the last 45 minutes, we've sat and we have learned from each other. Uh, you know, we've in, in this 45 minute uh, time, We've all had opportunities to lead and to learn. uh, And we have to create those atmospheres in uh, our learning communities and in our schools, uh, because it's the people that will make things happen for kids. And most definitely, I have been intrigued by what I've heard today. uh, And uh, it is great for me to continue my learning. Uh, And now I know that I have uh, others that I can reach out to uh, that can help me uh, answer questions and uh, deepen my learning. So I want to say as we, as we get ready to close this out, like if you came into this session to be like, I'm going to learn how to do design thinking, that's not, that was not what we were hoping to do. Uh, but there are definitely a lot of resources where you can go to learn the foundations uh, and really dive into learning how to do design thinking. Instead of what we wanted to do today was to have a conversation to to open up that concept of what design thinking is, what it might look like in your spaces, and of course, share this time and space to learn from one another as we deepen our understanding. So I just want to say thank you, uh, you know, Rob, for rejoining us in the space and continuing to be a thought partner and a collaborator, and as well to Saba for uh, joining us for the first time, and hopefully that you will be joining us at some point in the future. Saba, we learned a lot from you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I learned a lot from you guys. I gotta say, it's like one of the most creative shows I've been on. Like your little like segues, your intersections. Like I really appreciate like the thoughtfulness that you put into like creating this experience. I loved it. Well, that that would be credit to Wallace's design. To Wallace, <laughs> he's the guy behind the scenes that's pulling the strings and doing we all. We all have things. our strengths. We see what happens when we come together in that collaboration. <laughs> well, ding 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 ding. ding. <laughs> So again, thank you to all of you. Thank you to yeah, the guests you. of ours who have been uh, joining us. Um, but you know, we do have a next episode. So as we mentioned during our last episode, the next two are gonna be a little bit different. So we have one in November, one in December. Uh, so on November 12th, we're gonna be getting together to talk about a holidays, culture celebrations, because that is the time of the season that we are moving into. Um, and as we even touched on in this space, as we start to think about equity and, and differentiation for the various individuals that we have in our spaces, we should be cognizant on how we move during this time. And so, uh, you know, in celebration of how we normally move forward as we close out our episodes, we want to ask our two guests here, when you think about this idea of holidays, culture, celebrations in schools, what would be a question that you would want to ask a, a school leader? And I'll open it up, either Rob or Salah, go ahead and jump in. 
Wow. Well, that's a tough one, these, especially these days, I think. I, uh, I think that one of the things that we do is we, we want to celebrate and honor uh, as many cultures as possible, right? And, and, and do that. And so that's, a, that's an important piece. I think that sometimes it becomes trivial, trivialized into a checklist. And, that, and, and that's, that's unfortunate. But I, I'm not sure that I have a great solution for it. It's, a, it's an awareness and it's a discussion. And a, I, I, think it, I think it's a hard thing, but I think it's a thing worth pursuing. I think it's one of those provocative questions, Charles. We got to ask, how, do we, how can we do better and learn better? I would be so curious to know, just honestly, having been brought up as like a South Asian in like the public school system, like what holidays do you value? Because I will say, I feel like sometimes like there are a lot more holidays than we realize that are on like that are on and off the calendar. And so I was just really curious, like who, who are the people in your community? Like we've got different people and and how do, how do we go about acknowledging that we're ensuring whether it's on a calendar or not, that we acknowledge everybody's holidays or celebrations? Well, thank you. And you're absolutely right. There, there are we, we, we say a lot by the things that we do as we as we've talked in this episode those things that we celebrate are the things that we pay attention to and that we prioritize and it doesn't just go for achievements and accomplishments it are those celebrations of holidays and things like that as well and so when we forget or overlook people there is a very strong message that is being sent well thank you again for being here today it was such a great learning experience and it won't be the last time that uh that you are here uh, in this space. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing with us today. And Take care. Uh, we look forward to seeing y'all on November the 12th. All right. Until then. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Uh, bye, -bye. Thanks for watching and learning with us at School Rubric with educators from across the globe. For more access to articles, magazines, podcasts, live episodes, our international school directory, courses, and more, visit us at schoolrubric.org. Thank you.